verse 11 and following. The Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. And he left them, got into the boat again, and went to, and went to the other side. Now they had forgotten to bring bread, and they had only one loaf with them in the boat. And he cautioned them, saying, Watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not, do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes do you not see, and having ears do you not hear? And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves for the five thousand, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? They said to him, Twelve, and the seven for the four thousand, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, Seven. And he said to them, Do you, do you not yet understand? And they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked, Do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see men, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes. His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. And he said to him, and he sent him to his home, saying, Do not even enter the village. I know Barbara, it's just good to see you, Barbara. It's good to see you. I'm glad everybody's here today. I am glad that you're here to worship with us, and I just appreciate everybody being here. I really, really am looking forward to sharing this lesson with you because I really found this section of Mark to be really interesting. And one of the reasons I really like this section is right off the bat here with the Pharisees, we get to see some people that are just totally hypocrites, right? We get to see some people that are so unlike us, they're so pharisaical, we like to say it, right? I mean, they're the Pharisees. These people haven't got a clue. They're sitting there in front of Jesus, and they're demanding a sign. The Pharisees are demanding a sign. This is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and they're saying, give us a sign. We need something. You're not good enough. We need something. They want, they're looking for proof, right? I mean, these guys are so far off base. I am so glad I'm not like them, right? Because I don't need no proof, right? And these guys, they, they want proof. Prove it that you're Jesus. Prove that you're the king. Prove that you're the son of God, they're telling him. Then I got to thinking about that. I said, yeah. Sometimes we look for proof too, don't, don't we? Sometimes we go to God and we say, oh, you know, God, uh, if you could just grant me some strength to handle this situation. Or God, protect me from that over there. Or, God, bless me with blank. You fill in the blank. And I'll be a better servant. I will read more. I'll study more. Just prove to me that you're really here. Prove to me that you're really working in my life today. This morning in our class, we were downstairs, we were talking about that a little bit. We were talking about trusting God when we don't understand what He's doing. You know, trusting God when we don't understand what He's doing. And sometimes we don't want to invite God into the conversation because we think we've got it under control. And that's exactly when we need to bring Him to the conversation. Exactly when we think we got it under control is when He says, no, I'm in charge. We want, we want, and we want more, don't we? We want proof. We want proof and then we want more proof. There's never enough proof in the pudding, is there? There's never enough proof that Jesus is who He said He was. That His love is enough. We want more proof. We want to be in control. We want to be in charge. We want to be rich. We want to be free from our burdens. And a lot of this stems from us wanting to be powerful. We like the power that we see that God has in the Bible, and we want that power. Eve doesn't take the fruit if she doesn't think it makes her equal with God, right? She wants the power. We want the power. 
This is what motivation from power looks like. We want, we want, we want. But God does not want us to be motivated by power, does he? God doesn't say, come to me because I am the most powerful God. He doesn't say, bow before me because I am the most powerful God. He says, bow before me because I love you, not because I'm powerful. He doesn't want us motivated by power. As we read on, we read about the disciples, another group I just love to read about because I am so not a disciple. These guys are lost. They're clueless. You get the disciples sitting there and they focus on what they don't have. I mean, who in the room focuses on what they don't have? Not me. I don't focus on what I don't have. I mean, who sits around in a boat and complains because they don't have enough bread? I mean, come on, this is ridiculous. But these guys focus on what they don't have. They don't have enough bread. And I have to ask myself, what is the matter with this group of guys? They just picked up seven baskets full of bread. Are they that poor at planting? They just brought one loaf? I mean, you had seven baskets full and you brought one loaf? Well, I mean, that's your problem, right? I remember my auto mechanic back in Yuma used to have a sign. It said, lack of poor planning on your part does not constitute an emergency on my part. <laughs> I'm looking at these disciples going, man, you guys are really bad at planning. Or, okay, some, some people might say, well, they were distracted. They're there with Jesus. You would be distracted too. Well, okay, I could agree to that to some extent. But still, I mean, bread, that's kind of important. I mean, when you're a big guy, as it was stated in the elders' uh, meeting today, that I am over 200 pounds, just barely over 200 pounds. But <clears throat> that you're a big guy when you're over 200 pounds. You, you tend to focus on food a little bit. I mean, it's kind of important. It's what keeps us moving. It takes food to keep this machine moving. So, I mean, for me, I'm not really going to get distracted a whole lot about food. I'm going to bring a little more than a loaf, I would think. But, okay, maybe it's because they lack contentment. What do you think? Maybe one loaf of bread isn't enough for them because they lack contentment. In our daily lives, we don't have enough bread, do we? We don't have enough bread. Why? Is it because we did poor planning? Is it because we're distracted? Or is it because we lack contentment? We lack contentment from where we are at. We want more. We always want more. This is what I call the illusion of the American dream. The American dream says those that work hard will receive and those that work harder receive more, right? That was the American dream and that's what they were always building on and that's what pushed people forward. But the problem was we never got satisfied with this. We never got satisfied. Now I'm not saying that you should settle for second place. But I'm saying that when first place doesn't satisfy the need, we go out and get more. We want more. It goes back to the we want, we want, we want statement. We want more. We're motivated out of scarcity. That sounds exactly opposite of what I just said, doesn't it? Because I said we want more, but now I just said the word scarcity, which means there's not enough. But that's what motivates us wanting more is that we're afraid there is not enough to go around. I'm afraid sometimes as Christians, this is a motivation for us to not share the gospel. Sometimes as Christians, we're afraid that there's not enough of Jesus' love to go around. And so I'm going to hold that gift inside because I got it. And if you don't, I'm sorry. But I got it. That didn't go for everybody, but for some people, that's the way it is. I got it, and I'm going to keep it. You're not going to take it from me. Here's the secret, though. The secret to God's love is that it never stops. It never stops flowing. And if you share it with somebody, God will give you twice as much. 
so you can share it again and again and again. It's meant to be given away. It was given freely, and it's meant to be given freely. But we get caught in this scarcity movement. We get caught in this idea that there's not enough to go around. So get yours first. Jesus is warning of us, that, warning us of this. He's talking about the leaven. False motivation can lead to leavening of the whole loaf. That's what he's telling us. He says, if you're motivated out of scarcity, you're going to ruin the bread. If you don't put enough ingredients into the loaf of bread, you're going to ruin the bread. If you don't put enough time into sharing the gospel, you're going to ruin the gospel. That's what he's telling us. Be careful. Don't be like the Pharisees. Don't be caught up in being motivated out of power and out of scarcity. That's not what he wants us motivated out of. God does not want us motivated out of scarcity. He wants us to not sit around and worry about how little we have or how much more we need to get. Scarcity is not what God wants us motivated out of. Now we get to the last part of what Jay read for us. And I love this part. I, I, I wrote it as a headline. Man's blurred vision cured by Jesus. I know grammatically it's incorrect, but that's okay. Man's blurred vision cured by Jesus. Can you see it? Now I know some of you are sitting out there going, no, no, his, his blindness was cured by Jesus. But there's two stories there, isn't there? There's the headliner, man's blindness cured by Jesus. But then there's a sub-story there, blurred vision cured by Jesus too. This guy was blind, and Jesus gives him sight. Yeah? That's the front page story. Same goes for us. Without Jesus, you are blind. Right? That's the story that's on the cover. But let's look a little bit deeper. He says, without your focus on Jesus, your vision is blurry. Without focusing on Jesus, your vision, your vision is blurry. He cures the man's blindness. He says, what do you see? He doesn't say, I see you, Lord. He says, I see men walking around, or trees walking around like men. I see trees walking around like men. He doesn't see Jesus. He has blurred vision. We struggle with this because of our faith. We struggle with our faith because of fear. And sometimes we don't see what we're supposed to. We see trees. Because our fear blinds our faith. I want to share with you guys, for those of you that don't know, Sandra and I had an opportunity to take the kids and go on a backpacking trip. We were supposed to be gone Thursday, Friday, and Saturday this week. But we did not stay that long. And I want to share with you, I wrote a log of what we did. This is the Brock's first family hiking backpacking trip. And this is something I used to do as a Boy Scout and when I was younger, and I really enjoyed it. And I wanted to share the experience with my family. So, this is our log. 6.20 a.m., woke up late, hoping to be on the road by 6 a.m. 6.45, loaded in on the road, not bad with a wife, dog, three kids, and a shower. 7 a.m., back home, San forgot her cell phone. It won't work in the mountains anyways. 7.15, on the road again. Unfortunately, this is Thursday, and so is everyone else. 8.45, just past Broomfield. We're not moving very fast, as you can see. Daisy puked up all over the place. <laughs> nice. 9.40 a.m., arrived at Peaceful Valley, dropped off dog and food for Vicki and Chris. That's my in-laws, for those that don't know. Uh, we picked Vicki and Chris up, and we headed to the trailhead at Red Rock Lake. 10.17 a.m., Everybody is loaded up with their packs and we're headed down the trail. Chris and Vicky are going to take our truck back to their camp for us. That's where we were supposed to end was where they were camping. 1045. Showed everyone where I crashed on my bike a couple weeks previously. Found the exact rock that hit me in the cheek. Still am not aware of what hit me in the knee. 1050 AM. Barrett begins to complain. 
11 a.m. Stopped at South St. Vereen Creek for a rest, snack, and to repack our loads. 12.02 p.m. Arrive at campsite and set up. Only had them going a little over two miles the first day, so I wasn't pushing them real hard. Of course, I was in great shape. 12.30 p.m. Eat lunch, homemade sausage and cheese. Uh, next, we hang the food bag so the bears can't get it. 1 p.m. Short hike to gather flowers for Sandra into what we call Daisy's Pond. The pond has no name, so we named it Daisy's Pond for water. Our little water filtration pump works great, but it's very, very slow. Kids and I drink the water, Sandra not so much. 1.30 p.m., everyone goes back to camp. I head back up the trail to the last creek that we saw to get fresh water. I get plenty of fresh water, the pump works fine. It was just the scum in the pond that was plugging up the pump. 2 p.m., back at camp, everyone in tent for rest. Hmm, yeah, that didn't work. 2.30 p.m., kick boys out of tent. <laughs> they thought it was a place to play wrestling. 3.30 p.m., still no rest. So I help Remington collect and build a fire. Sandra helps Barrett build a teepee. Daisy eats bananas, all the bananas. <laughs> 4.30 p.m., fire is started, dinner is in the works, and Sandra and Barrett ran back down to the creek for more water. 5.15 p.m. Sandra and Barrett returned. Sand broke water filter and blamed it on me for not giving good instructions. I didn't. She was right. 5.30 p.m. Eating dinner. I like chili mac. It's good. Everyone else's mac and cheese, not so good. It is raining. 5.45 p.m. Scarfed food, burnt the rest, and ran into the tent out of the rain. 6 p.m. Tried it outside again. Rain seems to be calming. 7 p.m. It's raining. Packed up camp, hung food, and went to tent. 8 p.m. Everyone is asleep but me. Rain is hard. Thunder and lightning loud. 8.35 p.m. Too much rain for tent. Tent is leaking and Sandra and I are wet. 12.15 a.m. The next day. Heard a loud noise, no idea what it was, trying to go back to sleep. 12.35 a.m. Barrett is screaming and crying that his leg hurts really bad, wishes we didn't come on the trip. Sam holds him and he reluctantly stops crying and goes back to sleep. Any of those that have like a super duper medical degree, we have no idea what was wrong with his leg. <laughs> no idea. No visible bruising, nothing. He's just screaming that it was on fire. So. Next several hours, I quit writing the time. I get some sleep. Daisy and Barrett wake up crying at different times throughout the night. They alternated as to who was going to cry. 4 a.m., it's raining again. 5.30 a.m., bull elk bugles just up the hill from camp, moves down to pond and bugles again. That would have been great had I not been trying to sleep. 6.10 a.m., loud noise wakes me again. I cannot wake up fast enough to register what it is. 6.45, decide sleep is overrated and begin trying to move. I am very sore and stiff. It's kind of where I ended my log for the most part. But the rest of the day kind of went like this. I got up and started to break camp. I did get a beautiful morning by the water though. I got to see steam rise off this pond I didn't get to see any animals, but it was just peaceful and quiet. And I was sitting there and I was thinking about logging it. This was about seven o'clock in the morning. And I realized as I looked through my log that I've kept track of everything that had happened. And those things were fearful. They were things that were driving me out of fear. They were keeping me from sleeping. If you ask Remington about that night, what he remembers, was going to bed, that was around 8 o'clock. He remembers waking up, that was about 7.30 for him. He was at peace because he has more faith than I do. He has faith not to be afraid of what was happening outside. I said, what did you think of the trip? He goes, well, I was a little afraid, Dad. 
I was afraid that a bear might come into camp or that a moose or something. But he says, I know you were there. And I was okay. And so I went to sleep. See, he had no fear. He wasn't motivated out of fear. I, on the other hand, wish I wasn't motivated out of fear. But I am motivated out of fear. How many of you are motivated out of fear? We've talked about this a lot. We get motivated out of fear, and it's because we can't see Jesus because we see trees. We're not doing the things that we're supposed to be doing to focus on Jesus. We're not paying attention to Jesus, but we're watching the trees sway in the storm. We're watching the clouds develop around us. We're watching the waves crash over the boat. God does not want us motivated out of fear. God does not want us motivated out of fear. So by this point, you've got to be asking yourself, if God doesn't want us motivated out of fear, a fear of hell maybe, God doesn't want us motivated out of scarcity, there's not enough love, it's a narrow gate. God doesn't want us motivated out of power, that He is all-powerful. What is it that God wants us motivated out of? What are we to be motivated by? That is the million dollar question. What are we to be motivated by? What does the Bible teach us that we're supposed to be motivated by? It's not by what we don't have. It's not by what we're supposed to be afraid of. It's not by a desire to be in control of the situation. But what we're to be motivated by is by what we receive freely. Love. I had this conversation with a friend a while back and he said if we're not motivated by one of those three narratives scarcity, fear, or power then what are we supposed to be motivated by? I told him love. He says yeah, Jesus was love, I understand but what does that look like? What does that look like? Because this day and age, it's so hard to see what that looks like. And I said, the only thing I can think of is when I became a Christian. The girl that brought me to Christ eventually became my wife. And she showed me, right from the bat, that hell may be real, but that's not why she loves Jesus. That God is all-powerful and she can be powerful by being a follower of God but that's not why she loved Jesus and she showed me that love is overbounding that heaven isn't this big and people are fighting to get in it's unmeasurable and God is struggling to get you in there that's what it means to be motivated by love. We have a God who gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him will be saved. Not only a select few will be saved, but whoever will believe in Him will be saved. See, God's ambition is not to try to keep you out of heaven. It's not try to scare you about hell. It's not to show you that He's the most powerful person in the world. God is trying to motivate us out of love. He gives us that love freely. He shares that love with us freely. And He wants us to turn around and share it with those outside freely. He wants us to reach out to the lost. Not to keep them at bay, saying, when you get your act together, you can come in here. Not to say, when you get your life right, you can come talk to me. Not to say, here's a Bible, read the scriptures and get it sorted out. But he wants us to reach out and say, you know what? I've been there. I've struggled. I've faced some challenges in my life. But you know what? The one thing that comes back over and over and over is that God loves me. Amen?